Men like William Regal are few and far between. He has been a part of the business during five decades and has wrestled with everyone from Kendo Nagasaki to John Moxley, but his time in wrestling is one filled with misconceptions, be it of his own doing or the doing of the stories being lost over the years. Regal has his legend somewhat distorted. Most people believe that Regal was fired from World Championship Wrestling for his disastrous bout with Goldberg, which is an entire situation in itself that has more misinformation posted about it than maybe any other six minutes of wrestling on film. Though the bout was far from a good thing in the executive's eyes, it isn't in totality what would lead to them letting go of one of the greatest British wrestlers of the 90s. As has become common knowledge now, Regal was much more of a wild man behind the scenes than his character on television would have some believe. Regal has been candid in recent years that there were times during his run in World Championship Wrestling where he was out of control with his issues. 19, from a certain point in 1997 through 1998, I was you know, off the rails completely. So by the time I wrestled the Steiners in 1998, that wouldn't have been, that, that would have been great for me because, I, it, but I can't remember it. Um, I was very, very heavily into um, a lot of stuff at that time. And, um, taking a lot of pain pills and a lot of muscle relaxers and mixing it with a lot of other stuff. Uh, at, at that point when I was in WCW and I should have been fired, right? Um, they should have fired me before that podcast lately. I was wrestling with a broken neck since 1993, September of 1993. So there was times when I was, I had a lot of neck pain. There's a lot of, things that we can get into in different things of why I ended up where I ended up as far as substance abuse. Right. Some of it was injuries, but that's just an excuse because you only need it for a certain amount of time. Basically, I like taking the stuff. And so it's it just a cycle. Still all on me, it's still my fault um, because I should have got some proper help, but I didn't. I wasn't at that place yet. Regal had struggled to kick the habit through his career, and his WCW run was right in the midst of the worst part of that struggle. As you may know, this is much more common during that time, so simply having these issues were not enough for World Championship Wrestling to fire him either. Over the years, he had managed to keep himself a low enough profile that World Championship Wrestling didn't really have to or need to fire him. However, this would all change during one night out on the town and the subsequent morning where Regal's luck with WCW executives would finally run out. Regal would tell this story to Chris Jericho during his time on Jericho's show. So, that period of time, there was a few things. Uh, <laughs> I was off the rails in 97 and, and 98. Like there was a good 18 months where I was completely off the rails. Mm -hmm. I've just thought of something. I'm going to let the people know that I call you Noddy. Mm -hmm. And I call you Noddy. I've always called you Noddy yeah. from the first day I met Why you. Why did you call me Noddy? Because um, my favorite band as a child was Slade. Right. And as you know, and the, the, the lead singer, Noddy Holder. Incredible frontman was one of those big influences on me. Not, in, I never wanted to be a musician, but just the way that he carried his, his yeah. like persona. Well, he always had the big sideburns, oh. <laughs> and and they were a glam rock band. As a little kid, I was a big fan of, and so you, you I had were, the sideburns. You had the sideburns, no, or you just me reminded not. me of him anyway. The way you carried yourself, and you're, and you're like, <laughs> so nodding. This is one of those other things. I don't know if this had anything to do with me getting fired, but. The night after the Mike Tyson, um, Holyfield, Holyfield yeah, match, biting the ear off, biting the ear. I flew into Vegas because we had Nitro on the Monday night there, and I went out with Don Fry. Because um, 
because I knew Don from being in New Japan with him. And we had a bit of a wild night. And Brian Johnson, the first time I'd met Brian, uh, and we were out in a club, and I'm only ever going to incriminate myself any time I ever talk, but <laughs> I was somewhat medicated, mm -hmm. and as I was at that time, unfortunately, and uh, drinking a lot. And we were in this club, and Don just leant over and messing about, just little tiny headbutt on, on Brian Johnson. Next thing, we're surrounded by all these doormen, right? I mean, a big, and a proper big team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I, I say, I'm under no illusions about what I am. But Don's like, stood up. and So, I, I've stood up next to him, right? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I know what kind of a state I was in in them days. A, a good gust of wind would have knocked me down, never mind <laughs> yeah, anybody else. So. Right. so, all of a sudden, there's this like, bit of a standoff, and we've... Like Don's just walked through them all, and me thinking, you know, being delusional and, and, and whatever else I was doing, I, I've like <laughs> strutted out like I'm the Queen of Sheba next to him, you know what I mean? Like, look at me, you know, I'm all. <laughs> they could have all just ripped me to pieces, but Don had that thing about him. Yeah, they, all, they wouldn't have even known me, but they'd have all known Don yeah. at that time. Well, I get back to the hotel, it's like five o'clock in the morning. Most would consider a night at the Tyson fight and a brawl standing side by side with Don Fry more than enough excitement for one 24-hour period. Unfortunately for our hero, this was only the beginning of his adventure. Before the days of social media, almost every person on the card was expected to make towns as well as the press engagements with radio stations and local news station. It was one of the easiest and most reliable ways to let the general public know that the wrestling shows had come to town. And Mr. Regal had been slotted to make an appearance that he would never forget. I just realized, six o'clock, I've got a <laughs> pickup in the, in the lobby to go and do a load of radio interviews. Ooh. Cold shower, new suit. <laughs> Pick me up. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, proper, proper done in I yeah. So, it took me to the outskirts of Vegas, and there was this like big concrete building in the like right in the desert, really. What's this? This is where all the, there's four radio stations all in this one building. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going in and we do the do the country stage, you know, Nitro tonight, usual stuff, and the, the, the rock. The last one's the rock station, and I, I walk in, and I look at this. DJ and he's grinning away and he's got this big stupid full air band wig on and you can it's a real obvious wig and I'm thinking I know this fella and I don't like him and I don't know why <laughs> and I, I it's just like I know him I, why would I know him and this all this stuff's going through me why would I know this fella here and I don't know why I don't like him so I'm sat down and I'm doing here we're at, you know the MGM tonight blah 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 and he, so what bands did you like as a kid, you know? And so we start talking, I went, oh, I like Slade. And he went, oh yeah, he said, I know those guys. And I went, and then it hit me all of a sudden who he was. He was the singer at A Quiet Riot. Right. Kevin, what Kevin was Dubrow, Kevin who Dubrow. had a huge hit with two Slade songs. Right. Yeah. So he went, he said to me, I made those fellas a lot of money. Ooh. And I went, this is live on the air, right? I went, pardon? He said, I, I made those fellas a lot of money. I said, don't you think they made you a lot of money? And he <laughs> went, what? I said, well, the only hits you ever had were Slade's songs, so they made you a lot of money. You didn't make... And I'm like, it's before that, right? And he's gone, no need to be like that, man. And I went, before I knew what I was doing, I, like still half drunk dove over the top and I've got what? him by the throat. I've got him by, this is live on air, I've got him by the throat. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, I said, I'm going to knock this stupid wig off your head. Like I said, a syrup, you know, it's just yeah. rhyming slang for a wig in England. Yeah. Knock the stupid syrup off your head and I called him all kinds of things. <laughs> and the, the person who was with, <laughs> he's live on air, right? he's going, ah. <laughs> 
And the person from the, the WCW, uh, whoever, I forget who it was, but the PR person, just whispered in my head, I think it's time to go now, Steve. And I went, I think you're right. And oh, you know, like that, there's that instant hit of, oh, oh dear, what have I done? And how, how stupid. And I just did the walk of shame and walked out of there. So that was another thing. And then me just being me at the time I think helped me get fired from WCW Kevin Dubrow got you fired from WCW no 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 well there was a, there was a combination but Eric did the right thing though it would be easy to lay some of the blame for his WCW firing at the feet of Quiet Riot's lead singer Regal prefers to take responsibility for it and move on with life since he has got control of his issues he has become known as someone who mentors the younger talent and is one of the most well-respected figures in all of pro wrestling. But let it be known, even if you are a rock star, don't let William Regal catch you disrespecting Slade. 